Fixing a Dead LCD TV, today on Hidden Tech. This LCD TV, a Syntax Olivia, was brought to me with the symptoms of not powering on, so I figured the first place to look would be to check the power supply and see if there are any problems there. Don't try this at home if you're not familiar with proper procedures in soldering and working with electrical components because you could injure yourself. First thing is to remove a number of screws from the back panel and once that's done you can get inside and have a look at how the electronics are configured inside the unit. If you look underneath the um, plastic back plate you'll notice that there's a large metal box in the center and most of the electronics are contained therein. So again, there are a bunch of screws to remove and those need to be kept uh, organized so that you can put them back together. There are also at least five different cables attached, which makes it a little annoying just to try to locate the power supply, but uh, it can be done. There are two different cables to the speakers on the sides and then there is a circuit board on the front right here which contains all of the micro switches that go to the front panel so you'll need to remove that. I didn't bother to actually take the circuit board off I just left it attached to the cable I just unscrewed it so it would come loose and then from the other side let's have a look what's happening on this side yeah there is the micro switches which is the entire control panel for the unit and then underneath the box in the front we have the power supply which is uh, the unit that you see on the bottom there the circuit board uh, which is the left side once you place that down I left the cable going to the display panel plugged in so I didn't have yet another cable to work with. But if you do that, be careful you don't have too much tension on that cable because you could end up yanking something out of the socket or damaging one of the wires and that would lead to more complications that we don't want to deal with. So that looked pretty good. Once you get the power supply out, it actually looks fairly well constructed. There's a nice beefy heat sink with countersunk screws on it. But as we'll discover in just a moment here, um, all is not well with this particular power supply circuit. There are about uh, three screws here plus a couple of uh, guide posts to keep it properly positioned. So simply take out the screws, that's pretty straightforward. And this is the uh, low voltage DC side. Uh, there are some other components on the other side of the board that I didn't have to worry about. They actually were working properly. So have a look at this and see whether you can detect any problems. I'll give you a hint, it has to do with the capacitors shown with these red arrows. And if you notice, uh, they're all bulging out and there's even some electrolyte leaking out visible in a couple of these. So these, just by visual inspection, are no good and will have to be replaced. So the procedure is to desolder them and the technique I like to use is to first of all flow a little bit of fresh solder onto the uh, component leads uh, from the back side here because oxide will usually build up and that makes it very difficult to melt the existing solder. Uh, you can try applying some flux but I find that just putting some fresh solder which includes some new flux does the job very nicely. So once you add a little bit of solder on there, it's just a simple matter to reheat it and then pull the two leads out by rocking the capacitor back and forth. And I can usually get this in one or two up and down movements. So you apply a little bit of heat to either side and then pull out the uh, component. So we'll start by heating the uh, upper side and rocking downward and then heating the lower side and lifting upward and we'll do that one more time and it should come out and just 
pop it out like that. And there we go. There's our bad capacitor. Once it is out of the circuit, you then need to remove the solder that's in the hole so you can insert the new capacitor. And you can do that with some solder wick, or in this case, a, a vacuum solder sucker. It works quite easily. You just hold it up there and don't be afraid to touch the soldering iron. And click and out comes the solder, opening up the holes. And you can then insert the shiny new capacitor, which we have here. And please do note the polarity of the capacitor. The uh, shorter lead is the negative side, and that needs to be lined up with the thick line there shown on the circuit board. If you insert it backwards, the capacitor will pop almost immediately, and you'll have to replace it a second time, which you don't want to do. So short lead to the negative side, push it all the way down. And then I generally try to trim the leads first of all, so that when I flow the new solder over it, it covers the entire lead nice and smoothly. But you can also leave them in there, solder it first, and then clip them off afterwards. It won't really make a huge difference. But I find this works quite nicely. Uh, clip off one of them first of all, leave the other one in to hold the component in place, and then warm it up with the soldering iron. Uh, start by heating briefly on the uh, soldering iron side to create a heat bridge, but then move to the opposite side so that you can flow the solder uh, across the entire surface and then into the, um, the well so that you have solder filling the entire surface. So we'll try that again on the other side. Heat up the lead and Again, touch the solder onto the iron and then move immediately to the other side. Flow in some solder and then wipe upward to cover the entire lead with solder. This is what the failed capacitors look like. They each have a domed top and some of them exhibit some leaking electrolyte uh, more than others. Here's a close-up showing you a good example of the way the uh, orange electrolyte uh, leaks out and also the dome top. So any capacitors that look like that will need to be replaced. And for comparison, I will show you a good capacitor. This is a brand new Nichicon uh, replacement capacitor and you can see the top is perfectly flat and nice and clean. There's uh, no bulging or leaking of electrolyte visible at all. So if we want to be a little bit more formal about it, we can try to measure these capacitors and see what they look like. And this is indicative of a bad one where you just get this oscillation on the meter and it doesn't really give a steady reading. Uh, when you see something like this, you'll know that the capacitor is bad. Have a look at another one here, see what this one does. And this one gives a reading, but it's somewhat low. It's supposed to be a thousand microfarad, and we're around 800 or so, so it's uh, at least 15% or so low. And here's another one that oscillates. We're not able to get a reading on it, so that one's definitely bad as well. Needs to be replaced. Next one. This is supposed to be a 220, and we're getting a reading a little bit under 200. So this one is also more than 20% off. That's out of spec. And this one is only about 65, so that's way too low. Again, this is another 220, so that one's definitely bad as well. And for comparison, here's our replacement model, and it's just a uh, perfect 1,000 uh, microfarad, pretty darn close.
Now, there's another technique you can use which involves measuring the equivalent series resistance. And my meter has a table on here showing expected values, uh, 0.07 for the 1,000 microfarad. And for the 220s, you can go a little bit higher, 0 0.33. But all of the readings should be significantly less than a single ohm of resistance. And you need to do this at AC frequencies. A DC meter, of course, won't give you any resistance measurements. So we have one here, um, 0 0.4. Again, that's way too big for the 1,000 microfarad capacitor. So that tells us right away that it's no good. And take a look at another one. These are some 16 volt, 1,000 microfarad caps. And that one's 0 0.6. Again, that's way too high. It should be less than a uh, less than a tenth of an ohm. Preferably, even lower than that. Check the next one here. Make sure we have good uh, contact. 0.97, so it's almost a full ohm of resistance, so that's way too high, and this capacitor is never going to do its duty as a filter cap for the power supply. That needs to be replaced. We'll look at a couple of the smaller uh, 220s, and these can have a little bit more, but again, that's almost two ohms there. That's way too high. Um, 0.3 or so should be the limit, so anything higher than that is no good. And take a look at uh, the next one. Three and a half. So this one is really bad. Way, way too high. I mean, that's ten times over the limit. So that one's clearly bad. And if you notice, it's actually going down very slightly, but it doesn't make any difference. It's no good. And for comparison, we'll take a look at our brand new cap here and see what kind of a reading we get. And that's much better, 0 0.07. So that is what we would expect. And a cap with that kind of a low ESR will do a good job filtering. So once you get your caps all replaced and soldered in, it's time to reinstall the power supply circuit board. And as I mentioned earlier, it sits on the left-hand side inside this metal box after you flip it over. And from the other side, we can see how it's configured in here. And again, the construction of this TV is quite nice. It has some very heavy-duty grounding. Uh, there's a nice... Um, ground wire and screw that attaches uh, in numerous places, but this one going over to the main board where the processor is. And there's an umbilical cable that supplies the power to that board, as well as one that goes off to the other circuits on the other side. So just make sure you put everything back together again, including the ground wires. So remember where they connect. Sometimes it's obvious, like this one, but might not always be push on the uh, power umbilical connectors once again, make sure everything is tight, and make sure the caps are looking good. And the board itself is just held into place by uh, four screws. And put that all back together again. We'll go ahead and skip over the addition of the rest of the screws. That's not particularly interesting. Well, once you get everything back together, you then have to close the lid and reconnect all of the cables. And like I said, this is the one that goes off to the uh, sideboard. So plug that back in. And then there's also the cable that goes to the um, front panel connectors. So you have to put that all back together again. And now for the moment of truth. Turn on the main power switch, and there comes the power LED, which is a good sign. And now the front panel power button, 
And there we go. Success. So that is how you repair the Syntax Olivia LCD TV, at least if your problem is bad caps on the power supply, which I understand is quite common. If you've enjoyed this episode of Hidden Tech, why not subscribe to receive updates whenever new videos are released? Simply click the link on your screen. I'll have more episodes on the science and technology hiding in plain sight all around us. Thanks for watching.